Okay, we'll call the 17th regular meeting of Common Council to order. Sue, would you call the roll, please? Salmon? Here. Bird? Here. Bonet? Here. Serta? Here. Graf? Here. Laux? Here. Nanny? Here. Montemayor? Here. Perez? Here. Rinflesh? Not excused. Sagali? Here. Stefan? Here. Van Akron? Excused. Vanderweel? Here. Ann Warner? Here. 13 present. Quorum's present. Alderman Warner. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move to approve the minutes of the uh, November 15th and 22nd uh, meeting of the last of the Common Council that they be approved in the same standards entered on record. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the previous meetings under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Alderman Serta, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you remain standing, please, Alderman, for a moment? As you know, last week, Alderman Peterson lost his battle with cancer. Peggy Van Akron, wife of former Alderman and current State Representative Terry Van Akron and daughter-in-law of Alderman Donald Van Akron, also lost her battle with cancer. I extend my sincere sympathy to their families they will both be deeply missed. And in honor of the memory of Peggy and Bob, I ask that you join me in observing a moment of silence at this time, please. Thank you. Two things before we get into the uh, public forum. We also got a letter from Governor Doyle. It was sent, the original copy was sent to Mrs. Peterson, Bob's wife, Mary, and it said, I was saddened to learn of Bob's passing. I know he was a devoted, I know he was devoted to his family and was a respected member of his community. His contributions to the city of Sheboygan, particularly his efforts to revitalize the downtown, will always be remembered. I know this is a difficult time for you and your family. My thoughts and prayers are with you. Signed, Governor Doyle. Now with that, Bob's position, position, what we will do is take names for Bob's position for two weeks like we did previously when we filled Alderman Wagaman's chair. And um, the next meeting on the 20th, I believe, if the council so wishes, we could appoint an alder person at that meeting. But even submitting a name for the position now, you still must take out papers to run. It will only be a one-year position. You will have to rerun again because it's in between Bob's terms. Correct, Steve? So we will handle it the way we always do. If someone is interested in running for the position, Alderman Peterson's position, please submit your names to myself or city clerk, and then you will also have to take papers out. I do also, well, I already have one name. It's been submitted today for the position. Any questions on that? Okay. Steve, resignations. I have a letter from uh, Mike Hutz, risk administrative officer to the mayor. Uh, communicating that uh, he's intending to retire effective January 14th and his last work day would be December 30th. That can be accepted and placed on file. And a letter from uh, Bob Peterson to the mayor dated November 26th <clears throat> indicating that uh, he would have to resign as, a, as an alderman. That can be accepted in the file. Okay. Okay, moving on, public forum. 
um, Frank Coxand. <clears throat> And can you give me your address, please? 2829 Erie Avenue. And you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Last time I was able to uh, exercise the privilege of uh, addressing the council was November 1st. And uh, I made the assertion that uh, Sheridan Park is filled land. And from the expressions on some people's faces, it seemed to be um, quite a surprise. Shortly after that, there appeared a letter in the paper which stated the same thing. And I was curious, so I called the gentleman who wrote the letter and I asked him, how did he know that there was garbage or trash or waste? And uh, the gentleman said that his father worked for the city from 1925 to 1950. This gentleman is 71 years old, very vigorous 71 years old, in full possession of his faculties. And I said, well, you know, there's evidence that the park was already a level terrace by 1902. And without a moment's hesitation, without a second's pause, he said, well, of course, my dad heard it from the old timers who worked for the city. And it made sense because if there, was, there were city workers who had the same longevity of tenure that his dad had 30 years, thereabouts, 25, 30 years, that would take him back to the turn of the century, which when you study the city maps seems to indicate that at least by 1889, the land was still sloping, but by 1902, the land was level. So something happened in the meantime. He made an interesting comment. He said, you know, they didn't have waste management back then. And to quote him, he said, any old hole was good enough to toss your garbage in. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, he had the furniture companies, Crocker Chair, Phoenix, Mattoon. He said, you had the tannery. Now, that's a red flag. And he said, and then there's the brewery. He said, there's an alley it's still there goes straight from the front of the brewery to the middle of the park. And you know, it's not too implausible to think that those businesses, through some agreement with the city, used that park space to dump materials, probably save themselves some money, certainly would have saved the city some money in terms of manpower and fill to create a level terrace. While I followed up on that, I called people at the Milwaukee branch of the DNR and the Plymouth office of the DNR. I talked to Nancy Ryan at the Plymouth office, and I said, what happens if there are materials that aren't benign? And she said, well, you will not be allowed to develop it until an exemption is granted. And that exemption will require an investigation. Jim Schmidt at the Milwaukee office of the DNR told me that some of the things that you look for are have the materials migrated off-site. That is testing involved, quite a bit of testing. And he even said that you may not be able to use the site if there is a horrendous methane problem. He gave some reasons for that. And um, if the brewery was dumping organic materials there, very likely to be a methane problem. I talked to quite a few people, talked to Joseph Clark, the project manager for the Kimi Report, talked to Ken Al uh, Abbott at Alpha Terra, who does soils testing. And uh, see, one of the things that Jim Schmidt said is that um, there are vapor probes that will reveal the presence or absence of methane or the extent of methane. So I called Ken to find out what's involved in that. He said, well, you push a one-inch slotted PVC pipe into the ground just above water level. DNR requires that five days you sample it 
with the end open, five days with the end capped, and uh, you send the results off. And I asked them, well, what kind of materials do you get out of there? He says, well, out of six probes, you'll maybe get a five-gallon bucket. I said, do you have to send it anywhere? He said, nah. So right now, and this is what I mentioned to Nancy Ryan, I said, right now the situation is basically don't ask, don't tell. So he doesn't have to do anything about that park so long as we can't. Excuse me, Mr. Coxon, okay. your five minutes are up. I'm sorry. I will be glad to continue this in a week unless, or three, Thank two you. weeks, unless you want to hear more, because I have the details. Thank you. Thank you. John Berner, please. Mr. Berner, could you give me your address? 1919 Broadway. I'm sorry? 1919 Broadway. Okay. And you'll have five minutes, sir. Okay. Mr. Mayor, take it from an old man with a white beard. Forget about the bridge across the river. Please, trust me on this one. Trust me. <laughs> and about that park, if, uh, you know, there's methane gas in that, I think we ought to fence off that park and not let anybody in it to disturb the soil. I mean, we won't want little kids digging around in it, right? If it's hazardous. Well, anyway, I was going to talk a little bit on this anyway. Uh, I took this, I took 30,000 registered voters, right? And there's more than that. And I took 3,000, I gave you, instead of 2,900. Eight districts. Divide that up. That means there's 4,250 registered voters per district, and you got 375 signatures per district. Simple math. So I don't say how anybody can say you had 100% off your district. That meant somebody else's district didn't have anybody that signed that petition. And you, you should have, you, if you really wanted it, you should have had more names because you had Vicki Meyer on the radio, you had the press. I mean, you're always in the press, right? You were taking signatures against the park. You should have double that. <clears throat> You had all the advertisements for free. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got a letter from Mr. Perez in the mail. I talked to you earlier this year. And I've really been watching you during the Common Council meetings. And uh, I wasn't happy with you, Mir. And I, we were talking about you. Uh, but I don't think you could even fill his shoes. I listened to you with people on the Alcohol and Tobacco Committee. I mean, these people investigate people, and you want to give somebody a second chance. I think they, they, they really check into this. And I think they think of giving people second chances. But some of these people, that one person didn't even have an address. Send my mail to my ex-wife. How can you give, issue a liquor license to somebody that has no home address? That I couldn't understand. And then some of the theatrics you put on in here. That's, that's for sure. If you really want to change something, you can do it through the Common Council, because you're the ones that vote on it, not the mayor. And for the School tax, when you argued about with this uh, tax from the school and the tax here, you where is it 7%? What was ours? 5%? Right? 4.75. 4. I'll tell you what, teacher's contract is coming up this year. I bet you next year, school tax 7% plus goes up. I'd want to get off the school board too and be mayor. Uh, Another thing, I've, I've listened to people talk that were with your group on, uh, they're for you, which is good. Everybody should have their opinion. They say, you're going to bring jobs, uh, going to lower taxes. But you're raising taxes in one area. You're going to lower them here so they go up someplace else. We need industry. There's no doubt about it. And I think another two companies, if not one, will go out of business in the next two years. I see the school district, part-time help, 12 bucks an hour plus benefits. 
Walmart, six bucks an hour, no benefits. The only way you can create jobs is either having work for the city, the county, or the school district. And until we get some decent, decent manufacturing jobs back in the city. I thank you. Okay. Um, Henry Capitillo. Mr. Capitillo. Mr. Capitillo, can you give me your address again, please? That's 1619 North 38th Street in the town of Sheboygan. Thank and you, I, and you will have five minutes, sir. And I'm here representing Home Inc. Again, I brought another article from the Sheboygan Press. This one is from the Thursday, December 2nd. It says, Plymouth lowers tax rate and levy. It says, Plymouth taxpayers got an early Christmas present Tuesday. The Common Council passed a 5.5 million budget for 2005 that cuts both the property tax levy by 3% and the property tax rate by 9%. Apparently the taxpayers of Sheboygan were not good this year because they got a tax increase. The other article is in the Sheboygan Press. It's in the editorial page. It's on the December 3rd issue. Good news for taxpayers in Plymouth budget. Again, tax cuts. On the Sheboygan Press front page cover of the November 23rd, it says, city budget needs levy hike. Well, I'll tell you what, they didn't ask me because I definitely don't need a, a tax hike or a levy hike. Maybe this is a misprint from the Sheboygan Press where it should read, city budget needs 6% levy hike because city is under, unable to control its spending. And I was here at the last public hearing and I don't know if it did any good. You come here for a public hearing um, you basically make suggestions. Uh, when I called the clerk's office, they said, well, they're not going to really act on the budget. It's basically the input, and it'll probably be the next uh, city council meeting. Lo and behold, right after the public hearing, everything was voted in the tax levy, the tax rate, everything. Um, I'm pretty sure if all the municipalities got a letter from Governor Doyle and says, you know, we'd like to have you all come to Madison to give your input on how we're going to develop the, the uh, revenue sharing plan for this next year. And everybody showed up at this meeting. And then after the meeting, Governor Do Doyle says to you, well, by the way, um, before you leave, let me hand out the uh, next year's uh, tax revenue sharing plan that we have in place. I'll tell you, most of you would be on the front page of the paper or the television stations would be quoting you of how this was a sham and that uh, how can he ask you to provide input and then be there and not, not take your concerns seriously. Well, that apparently happens here because if you really did want to know what happens and what people think, you'd at least wait some time or even review the things that they have to say. The, uh, the other thing that I did say was you should probably look at making some cuts in some of the uh, the benefit package that you have for the uh, employees. I think that's one of the areas, the health care cost. What I did is I took a copy of the information that you were looking at last week, or I mean the last city council meeting, and on the, the uh, section it says narrative executive re review expenditures, and this is from the mayor's office. It says uh, fund 101 by fund two, and it says general mayor regular salaries 131,128. And then it goes to Social Security, which is probably benefit package 11,171. Also goes to Wisconsin <coughs> Retirement, 17,196. Also includes health insurance, $56,181. If you take this and you add up all the fringe benefit package according to these figures that are on this sheet, you come up with a benefit package of 62.1%, and of that, 
you're looking at health care benefits alone are 40.7 percent. I don't know if the two means there's two employees there. I'm pretty sure the mayor doesn't receive a salary of 131,000. But if you're looking at their benefit package, by the time you get through with that, if you were to if you were to look at this and say, well, my God, what kind of what kind of benefit package do they have here? Even if, let's say, the mayor were to pay 20% of its health care costs, you're looking that that would be if it's two employees, we're talking $5,000 a year. It would save the city almost $11,000 for that year. If what the mayor said last meeting that the majority of the budget, which is Excuse salaries me, Mr. and fringe, your time. I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Um, the next one is Dulcie Johnson. Dulcie, could you give me your address, please, again? 1306 North 3rd Street. And you will have five minutes. Mayor Schramm and council members, and Mr. Capitello, I share your frustration with the budget process. Mm -hmm. I sent a letter to the mayor with copies to each of the aldermen at the request of the mayor with numerous suggestions for uh, budget cuts. It was circulated to any number of committees, but I don't think a single recommendation was accepted. <clears throat> One of the issues on tonight's agenda is the consideration of the creation of a municipal court. I wonder, however, if this is a done deal, as document 1757 by Alderman Groff already authorizes appropriations from the general fund to the municipal court fund. Interesting. At a time when you should be consolidating and sharing services, you are creating a new bureaucracy, a new empire, which will mean more employees, more benefits, insurance, retirement, a proposal that you already know will lose money the first year and realize insignificant earnings the second year. And of course, all of this is based on assumption. Additionally, the plans for the new police station will have to include a room for the court, and I presume that the cost of this has been calculated in the cost of establishing the court. You also have documents on the agenda to fund architectural plans for a new police station, and I don't know where that's going now, but some months ago, police officer Winter opined on the value of a north and south substation in addition to a new main station. In October, the press carried a story about Appleton's police station. The council there held up money for remodeling their existing downtown facility, if you can believe it, to consider instead creating precinct sites. Maybe that's something that you should look at, because the taxpayers cannot afford a new central station and two substations. And speaking of the police department, even though the police oppose sharing dispatch services with the county, this is not a reason to dismiss the idea. The idea of shared services is in the best interest of your constituents. Instead of paying half of the county's dispatch services and 100% of the city's, you have an opportunity in the long run to save taxpayers dollars by sharing services with the county. And the time to do that is now. It works in other counties and cities, and it can work here. If the dispatchers and police really want it to work, it will. With taxes going up 4.75% this year, plus $36 for the rain tax, you have a responsibility to do everything you can to reduce the tax burden on your constituents. And then we have the new fire station, which is moving right along. And I can't speak to the need for this new station, but if the fire chief can spare three men to a new station, as he has stated, and not hire additional men, you need to reduce the fire department TO by three men immediately, because the chief seems to be saying that he has three extra firefighters somewhere. All too often, you seem determined to not take measures to save taxpayer dollars. The marina proposal from Mr. Rosenthal is a perfect example. Even though the city cannot sell the marina, Mr. Rosenthal also proposed leasing the facility, which was the original concept when the marina was built. Remember, we were told that someone would pay a million dollars to operate that marina. That has not happened, and instead the taxpayers have subsidized it to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars for many years and will continue to do so for many more years. 
I know that Mr. Rosenthal's latest communication indicates putting the marina issue on hold and instead concentrating on the riverfront slips first, but you surely owe it to your constituents to lease the marina to Mr. Rosenthal or to anyone else who makes such an offer. Why is it so hard for you to make decisions to grow our tax budget, our tax burden, rather than to reduce it? <clears throat> Finally, I find it totally unacceptable that 28% of our city employ employees live outside the city. Former Alderman Schultz, in a letter to the editor, said that 25% of the firefighters live outside the city. They have no problem asking for and accepting out-of-line pay increases and benefits, but they obviously do not want to help pay their way and instead choose to live somewhere else. This is an issue that the council must address and correct. Many others share my frustration in the seemingly oblivious way that you continue to spend and spend with little regard to the costs incurred and what those decisions mean to your constituents and an ever-increasing property tax burden. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? That's it. Okay. Alderman Berg, you had something you wanted to say. You get it. Take your time. What I'd just like to get up and say tonight is uh, we heard from my son-in-law, First Sergeant Timothy Arnack, from Iraq, and he said I should thank the older persons, the girls in the clerk's office, the uh, office girls down at municipal building, and some of the county supervisors that have been helping me and my wife send all these packages of all the items that they've been requesting, which they really need bad and he wants me to thank everybody. And I also want to thank the senior citizens at Sheboygan Regency House that I manage, They've, they stepped forward. And most of all, I'd like to thank Schenck Business Associates who have stepped forward and are backing me with paying all of shipping costs for all the packages for Iraq. So I just want to say thank everybody who's been involved with me and my wife for shipping these packages. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for doing a good job. <coughs> okay, we have one notice this evening and asked for a vacation and discontinuance of Niagara Avenue from North 6th Street to North 7th Street. And we have one document that goes along with that vacation and Alderman Warner, would you like to pull that ahead at this time? Yes, I'd like to pull ahead document 1204. Cesaro 275 It's document 1204. In matters laid over. Page nine of the agenda. Alderman Warner, proceed. I thank your honor on that. I would move to accept and file the report of officer and that the ordinance be passed. Second. We have a motion before us accept and file the RO and place the ordinance on passage under discussion. Under discussion, your honor, uh, this vacation of Niagara Avenue will allow the Sheboygan Senior Community Incorporated to move forward with the development of the landmark tower project. Uh, this is the former Sheboygan Retirement Home and Beach Care Center. Uh, this, they, they will pay all costs of relocating all of the services, the public utilities that are there. Uh, the project will be a great addition to the future of Sheboygan, uh, Sheboygan senior citizens, and likely maintain Sheboygan's reputation not only as a great, great place to live, but also a great place to retire. And uh, the Planning Commission also recommends approval. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, would you call the roll? Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. 
Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. And Bauman. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. Thank you for coming this evening. Or do you got? Okay, hang on guys, which one is that, Steve? So let's take 1665 also. Sixteen sixty-five. Where do you see that, Steve? Okay. Sixteen sixty-five. Sixteen sixty-five. Oh, I got it. Okay, is that all? Sequence. Okay. Yeah. Alderman Warner. Thank oh, you that's not. Alderman Bauman. Excuse me. Alderman Bauman. Well, thank you, Your Honor. On the sixteen sixty-five, I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. And this is authorizing enter into a development between the Sheboygan Senior Community Inc. and the City of Sheboygan. Your Honor, there is a uh, mistake on page two, paragraph number three. Okay. To where the third sentence down of states of Niagara Avenue between North 60th Street and North 7th Street, which just should say 6th Street. Okay. Good eye. If there's another discussion, would you call the roll, please? Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Lautz? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Sigali? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Warner? Aye. Bauman? And Berg? Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carry. Now, thank you for coming this evening. <laughs> We also have a hearing this evening. A hearing is scheduled this evening relating to the City of Sheboygan, Wisconsin Industrial Development Revenue Bond Series 2004 Panoplast USA Inc. project in the amount of $3,200,000. Any interested persons wishing to be heard on a hearing? Any interested persons wishing to be heard? Alderman Groff? Your Honor, I move that the hearing be closed. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Did you want to pull that one ahead also? No. Don't? don't? Need to. Okay. We don't need to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alderman Warner, consent agenda. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that all rules be accepted and placed on file. All RCs be accepted and adopted, and all resolutions, substitute resolutions, and ordinances be passed. We have a motion before us that all our O's accept, be accepted and filed, our C's be accepted and adopted. If resolutions and ordinances be put upon their passage, that's 17 1 through 17 28. Under discussion, Alderman McGraw. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to pull forward 17 21. Okay. And I need to make an amendment after uh, the word file. Instead of the period, it should be a comma and then and. And the words, and to approve the sale of the land, should be added. And I would so move. Second. Okay, we have an amendment on the floor, a motion is second to amend the document. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. In your honor, as amended, I would move that the document be put upon its passage. Moved and seconded document 1721 be put upon its passage under discussion. Hearing none, Sue, would you call the roll, please? Um, Graf. Aye. Lauchs. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. 13 eyes. Motion carried. Everything else, 17 1 through 17 28, Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to pull uh, 17 28 and uh, first ask for an explanation of uh, what was behind this, if I could. Finance, Alderman Stefan or Groff wants to speak on that or? I'm going to have Rich speak on that. Rich? <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, this amendment uh, was uh, initiated by the county, who is uh, changing the rates for the uh, dog licenses. And uh, the, it is, uh, of course, under state statute that the county has, has the authority over the dog licenses, and they, they receive the fees, except for administrative fee that we receive. Um, the council uh, has elected to have um, cats also licensed. And in the past, we have kept the cat licenses the same as the dog licenses. But that's under the prerogative of the council how they wish to do that. If there are any other questions I can try to answer? Thank you. So we have to do this because the county has... The dog licenses is required, yes. But the cat licenses, we don't it, have... Yes. Yeah, so you would not have to have cat licenses at all, except our, our ordinance has that in. It has been there for decades. But not all cities have to have cat licenses. So we have no control over the, uh, the amount for the dog licenses, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. All involved. Also, another point of clarification on the exact same uh, ordinance is that the uh, city only retains 25 cents per license for the dogs. That being either the uh, the five dollar fee, which the county does initiate, and the twelve dollars, ours being five and a quarter plus twelve and a quarter. Also, for the cat licenses, the city does obtain only thirty percent of that. The rest does go directly to Humane Society. Okay. There's no other discussion. Sue, would you call the roll? Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. And Graf. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 1729 through 31 to be referred. And 1731 was brought in by Alderman Montemayor, not Alderman Sigali, correct? Right. right. Okay, got that correct. 1732 hold for 1752, and then 1732 through 46 to be referred. 1747 resolution by Alder McGraw for a final resolution regarding the industrial bond revenue bond financing for Panoplast USA Inc. Alderman McGraw. And I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage. It's been moved and second a resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Alderman Stephan. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, this is regarding a grant that the uh, this firm got the state. I just think we should maybe explain it to the people. You know, to congratulate the company and let them know what's going on here. Exactly. I don't know if you know the representative wants to do it or if one of you guys want to, but I think it should be noted. Exactly. Sir? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Gore. I'm the managing director of Podonoplast. How do you spell your last name, sir? Gore, G-O-H-R. H-R, thank you. Uh, the monies from this uh, industrial revenue bond <clears throat> are for uh, capital equipment to increase our capacity excuse me, to supply, a little nervous, to uh, supply our markets in pipe and wire. I think uh, equipment will add uh, 10 to uh, 15 people during the 2005. <laughs> Extremely nervous, I don't speak in public often, so excuse me. I'd like to thank everybody for their support and uh, we look forward to uh, growing even further in the upcoming years. Well, thank you for believing in Sheboygan and growing here. We appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, if there's no other discussion, would you call the roll? Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Bonet, Aye. Serta, Aye. Graf, Aye. Laux. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 
1748 by Alderman Groff authorizing accepting funds from the Sheboygan Area School District Recreation Department for reseeding Kiwanis Park. Alderman Groff. And I would move that this resolution also be put upon its passage. Moved and second, a resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion, Alderman Warner. Under discussion, Your Honor, I would just, if Alderman Groff could explain exactly what this is, I think it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Alderman Groff. No, I'm sorry, I can't because we just accepted their money and for the reseeding project. So I don't know if Rich Tom? has any additional information on that or Tom. It's for reseeding the athletic fields at Kiwanis Park. It's about 1500 bucks, I believe, uh, worth of grass seed. I don't know where the money came from. <laughs> from, from the school district. Oh, I didn't know that part. Okay. We got the money, but we don't know where it came from. No, it came from the, it, came from the it says right in here. Yeah. Um, recreation Department through the National Football League. Okay, good. It's in the document. Very good. Read the document. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Yikes. For everybody's benefit, it's shared services. <laughs> Thank you. Alder McGraw, 1749, resolution by Alder McGraw authorizing transfer appropriations in the 2005 budget. Alder McGraw. Your Honor, I would ask for a suspension, please. We have a motion before it's in the suspension. Are there any objections to the suspension? Any none, proceed. I would ask that the resolution, I would make a motion that the resolution be put upon its passage. Do I have a second? second. Okay. Under discussion, Your Honor, this is so that um, uh, Mead Library can move um, $99,400 from their fund equity to restore the $75,000 that we cut um, or we reduced their budget by earlier um, this year or in November, I guess uh, it was, and uh, then also to restore the salary and fringe benefits that they had taken out. And this will, ha this will give them the opportunity to be open on Friday, I believe? Correct. Extend our work. Okay, if there's no other discussion, would you call the roll, please? Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. <clears throat> Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. And Montemayor. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 1752 through 63 Wait. to be re Alderman Warner. Jim, did we do 50 and 51? Oh, excuse me, 1750 and 51 lie over. 1750, 51 lie over, okay. Alderman Warner, on 1752 you're speaking? On, actually, actually, Your Honor, on 1732 and 1752. Okay. On that, Your Honor, first I would make a motion to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension? Yeah. Alderman Perez. I'd like to object. Okay. And I'd ask for an explanation before we vote on it. Okay. Alderman Warner? Uh, the reason is, is I, I intend to accept the file of the RO and that the resolution be put upon its passage. Alderman Perez, you're still on. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I guess I'm, uh, could you explain why the urgency here to move along uh, and hire uh, Half a million dollar architect outside firm. Sure, I'd be glad. Please do. Thank you. You bet. On that, Your Honor, first I would, we got a vote on suspension for the rules. Hang on. Steve? I, I think the question is that Alderman Perez is trying to find out why, why you're, asking you're asking for, for suspension. suspension. Okay, the reason, I'm asking, the reason I'm asking for suspension is to allow the process to move forward this year so that the, the design firm that was picked by, our, by the group that reviewed the consultants and the uh, architects can s start this year getting ready to prepare uh, next year to move forward with the project. Just gives them a couple of weeks. If, they, if we wait till the 20th, what ends up happening is there's very little activity from the 20th to the end of the year. This allows them a couple of weeks to kind of get things set up 
prior to the holiday season, which most businesses have a difficult time operating during those times because of people on vacation and a long holiday week. So this will just help things move forward a little quicker. Okay, now we got to vote on a suspension, so hang on. Because there was objection to the suspension, correct? 32. Call the roll, please. Okay. Uh, let's start with Sigali. Aye. Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Warner? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? No. Montemayor? No. Perez? No. Uh, ten eyes, three no's. So is that. Uh, suspension of the rules requires three quarter vote. Okay, so that will it'll lie over till the twentieth. Is that three quarters of the members president or the council? Three quarters of the council. members elect of the council, so it would require twelve votes to suspend the rules. Okay. Alderman McGraw. Yeah, just a aside with that. It's been brought up twice now that that supposedly that the Sheridan Park area has fill in and it has to be be checked or may have to be checked. Has anybody looked into that? Not to my first thing, Your Honor, when you build anything, you're going to do soil checks before you build there in the first place. Second place, that's been a park for parkland for over 150 years by someone we were claiming just a few weeks ago. Uh, of course, we would do soil borings before any construction would start, as we would on any site. It's uh, similar to the county site, which actually has more modern materials, gasoline and fuel oils leaking into it, and all those issues that were dumped there by the county. In that case, we did borings there and found out what the environmental status was. And there is money in the budget to do that soil sampling there, because we're not going to build on a site that can't be built on. So it's pretty much a moot point. OK. Alderman Perez, back to you. Thank you, Mayor. I guess I was a little concerned, because I, I understand uh, there are some emails floating around and some conversation uh, being exchanged about uh, uh, the county having a, an interest to, to, uh, to look again at the 23rd location. Uh, it appears, uh, from what I understand, that all, all, if not most of the obstacles that were in the way uh, at the time that Sheridan Park was uh, selected, that those obstacles are no longer there. Uh, there's been, I understand, at least a couple of meetings held. Uh, some city people have attended, and those issues have been addressed. Um, I think that if uh, we allow ourselves maybe a little time for these individuals to step forward and perhaps uh, share with us some of uh, their ideas and their concerns, uh, the, the main concern being the loss of a great opportunity to really investigate and seriously take a good hard look at shared services. Uh, I also understand from some of our uh, state legislators that in a year or two, there will be strings attached to uh, revenue sharing. Uh, one big string will be uh, you get revenue sharing in the same amount or less if you share or consolidate services. So this is a, a pretty big thing in my mind that perhaps we should uh, uh, allow these uh, individuals to come forward, and I think these two weeks will, will, weeks will, will do that. And uh, then we'll just take a look at uh, the proposition, and if it's a good one, we'll consider it. If it's not, uh, we move on. But uh, I think that the people involved are uh, very respectable citizens, and uh, we should uh, just wait a couple of weeks and then move on. Okay, is there any other discussion? Okay, if not, we move on. 1752 through, through 1763 to be referred. 1764 to be referred. 1765, by law and licensing, recommending denying taxi cab drivers license 6627 based upon failure to include all re relevant, relevant convictions on the taxi cab driver's license application. Alderman Bonet. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I make a motion to accept and adopt the report of committee. Second. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to ask if uh, Steve Broder is present. Uh, would you like to speak to the Common Council? Um, 
Um, not really sure what to say exactly. I was just told to come here and try to plead my case. I wasn't really um, fully understanding what convictions I was supposed to list. Uh, I thought it was just for a felony. I thought I listed that. Um, I guess I did not. Um, basically, I, I really just need this job, and I, I, I'm not really sure what else to say. <laughs> if I can answer any questions, I'd be more than happy to. Alderman Boney, you're still. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, if uh, our city clerk could maybe explain the process for starting with the fact of what's asked of the, of the person when they come up for the license? Um, basically, when we have either a taxi cab driver's license applicant or a bartender, same process. Um, they come into the office, and we take down the information, their basic name, address, phone number, all that kind of thing. And one of the main things on our questionnaire that we enter into the system is we ask, um, have you ever um, had any convictions, whether it be federal, state, local, ordinance violations, any confrontation with the police whatsoever, ever. That's what we ask everybody. That's just a pad and, and what we ask. And okay. then we record whatever they tell us. Okay. I, I guess the issue is here, you didn't record all the convictions and you didn't, um, you weren't forthright with those. You also, I guess the committee took in review of that also with the fact that, I mean, there was a list of convictions behind that even on top of that that was as long as my arm. Um, in, in very serious matters. So, I mean, that was what the com committee reviewed. Uh, at the time of the application, I, I, I spoke with uh, Ms. Richards about certain convictions, about the fines that I had to pay before I could actually get my license. I thought at that point that all of my convictions were out in the open, that I did not need to list any other convictions. Uh, I, was, I was given a total and I was given a, a period of time of which I could pay it while on a probationary period. At that point, I thought everything was out in the open. I thought I know you didn't report all the, all the convictions at the time, so. And it came back as recommendations from our city attorney's office in denial, so. And the committee was un, uh, unanimous in the decision to deny the license. Thank you, Honor. Okay. Alderman Manny. Uh, thank you, Honor. A key thing for us, too, is that uh, you were requested to come before the, the committee so that we could discuss these things with you and have a good sense of an overview about them before we brought that uh, recommendation to this body. So that's a, a chief concern, too, when you re don't respond to that overture. After two approaches to you, then we have to make a decision without your presence. Uh, this was the first date that I was given, it was December 6th. I actually had to take off of work to come here, so. If I would have known ahead of time, I would have been there. Alderman Stephan. I guess my question originally was, uh, are these convictions relevant to, the, to having a driver, uh, taxi cab license? I mean, I know, obviously, with bartender's license, we, we look at you know the type of conviction they are. I guess I don't really want to know what they are necessarily, because it's your privacy. But do they, are they relevant to driving a taxi cab? They came back out the traffic back. We're relevant. I mean, they're. Maybe that's why he came back with a recommendation of denial. Alderman Vanderwell. Thank you, Your Honor. So did you, did you receive any letters from the city stating that you should uh, appear? Yeah, I received a letter uh, that it was recommended that it was denied, and they, give a date, they gave a date of December 6th. Did, did you receive any letters before that? No, I did not. Okay, Sue? So? From what I understand, he was not asked to come before the committee. That's my understanding. You did not receive any letters prior to tonight? Correct. I, oh, never mind. I, I guess uh, I would make a motion to send him, send his document back to the committee so we can discuss it in committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second before us to refer it back to committee under discussion. Alderman Manny, did you? Thank you. I just very quickly, uh, I'll vote in favor of this, but then we'll expect you to be there so we can talk through it well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Would you call the roll, please? And this is to send it back to committee. Send it back to committee. Okay. Um, Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Warner? Yes. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? 
and Sigali. Thirteen, <laughs> 13 eyes. Motion carried. You can call me, call our office tomorrow and I'll tell you All right. what'll happen next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 1766, by law and licensing, recommending filing document authorizing the Common Council to present communications from citizens in their districts directly to the city clerk from the council floor. Alderman Boney. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, make a motion to accept and adopt the report of committee. Second. We have a motion and a second before. It's under discussion. Under discussion. I, I voted uh, against filing this. I feel that it is appropriate to bring documents to the floor in the last minute. So. Okay. I think it uh, gives the constituents an extra chance for having their voice heard to the people. Alderman Warner. I thank you, Your Honor. I too will vote against, uh, against filing this. I think uh, I, I presented this on behalf of Dr. Carl Table at his request to allow the presentation of public communications to the clerk directly from the council floor. Uh, I don't recommend that we do that with every document that comes in, but if you happen to get one on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday, before Common Council and you can't get it into the clerk's office in time, if you can bring it up to the clerk at that council meeting, the feeling was that would at least allow a little, a little easier access to it. Um, I guess I don't see what harm it would do if you, if you bring something in at that time. It just might help that document get through the uh, council process faster and get to the committees faster to address the constituents' concerns. And that was the direction I wanted this document to take us in, to allow, to keep doing it the same way we are getting our documents into the clerk so she can get them set up and sent to the right committees on our agenda, but allow the presentation of ones that you get from people right before the council meeting after the agenda came out that they can just get into the council quicker that way. So I'll vote against filing. Alderman Montemayor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm not on that committee, but I attended that meeting. And I, and I did hear from Sue that this was done in the past and it was stopped for a very good reason. I don't know what the very good reason was, but you did say that it was stopped for a very good reason to not do this anymore. And then also our question was, if it's not on the agenda with a person's name and the letter, how can we possibly legally address it that evening? Uh, I would say you probably shouldn't address it as far as taking any action on it. Uh, you know, as far as bringing it in, giving some explanation perhaps is one thing, but uh, uh, taking any action, I would agree, unless it's on the agenda. I just want to reiterate, it was done in the past and it was stopped for a very good reason, we Correct. were told. Thank you. Correct. And the reason was when the alderman would come in, there'd be four or five communications, two minutes or three minutes before the council started. And at that time, Pat would have to write down and figure out where these documents had to go to. And it was a hassle. This way, if they pr they're presented before, like we're doing them now, you can get them on the agenda so people have a right to read them. As we presently handle yeah, it. Right. As we presently handle it. And Thank I believe you. that was part of the argument of not doing it anymore, bringing them in the night before, right up to first, or the last minute before the council started. Correct? That's what I understand from Pat, yes. Yeah, uh, if I could. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I can't speak for the clerk's office, but I think it was done for, uh, you know, to streamline the council meetings. Uh, the communications could just as easily come in uh, to the clerk's office, get on the agenda, and be part of the agenda. And that, uh, I recall in the old days, uh, Dulcie Johnson back there, it, it was in her days when the alderman would stand up and read the communication and you know it would be handed to the clerk and the clerk yep. and the mayor would decide where it's going to go and you know you certainly do that but it, it, I think administratively it, the council meeting flows a lot better when those come in to the clerk's office in advance and get on the agenda and just get referred. And everyone has a chance to review them so you know what we're talking about. Alderman Press. Thank you, Your Honor. Just I, uh, I serve in the Law and Licensing Committee and I voted uh, to file this and I will vote uh, to file it tonight. I agree with Alderman Werner that uh, should this pass, we wouldn't want to do this uh, with every communication, but the fact remains you open the door to allow that to happen. And I, up until now, I don't recall having any communication from anybody about any subject that's uh, so eminent that needs to be uh, submitted in that night 
as it is now, we do have a short staff uh, city clerk's office, and uh, I can see where it would create some disruption and perhaps uh, uh, just totally disrupt the, the process that we have now, which in my mind, I believe everybody understands that it, it works. Alderman Vanuel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, my question is for the city clerk. If I was to receive a communication Saturday or Sunday before council, when was the latest I'd be able to get it to you? Or um, to be on other matters? I can do it. The latest I'd like to get it is mid-afternoon on the day of the council meeting because I have to run the copies for all of you and get them up here. So 2 o'clock in the afternoon would probably be a uh, reasonable time, 2, 3 at the latest probably. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Warner. Oh, thank you. And I remember well how it used to function. Uh, you used to get this little header stapled to your document to, from your constituent that the clerk would have to type out all those things and have them on everybody's desk. And then each council member that had something coming in would read theirs and, and bring one, two, three, four, five of them up to the clerk and say, submitted to the common council by myself. Uh, they do that all the time. And that wasn't the intention of this at all to get back to that totally. That was just to allow us to bring a document in, give it to the clerk. It's going to get into her office. She, they're going to have to decide which committee it goes to and forward it to them. We won't know that at the council meeting. It's not discussion or passage of the document. It's just allowing another avenue of getting a document in and letting the people know that, that their document was, was sent into the clerk's office. You know, we may not think some of the concerns that citizens bring forward are important, but when a citizen gives you a document and a concern on a piece of paper, it's important to them. So that's why I brought this forward. I think, you know, we're not here for what's important for us. It's what's important for the people bringing their concerns to us. I'll vote against finally. Okay. There's another discussion. You want to roll on that? Mm hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a motion to file the resolution. Right. Uh, Van. An I vote would be to file. Thank you. Uh, Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. No. Bauman. Aye. Berg. No. Excuse me? No. Okay. Bonet. No. Serta. Aye. Groff. Aye. Lauchs. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Sigali. No. Stefan. Aye. Uh, nine eyes, four nose. Motion carries. Okay. 1767. By Public Works recommending approving the stormwater utility fee adjustment policy. Alderman Bauman. The Honor, I'd move that this document be accepted and filed. Second. And the resolution? Mm -hmm. and, well, and the resolution also filed. Yep. Okay. We have a motion and a second before us that uh, we accept and adopt the report of committee and the resolution be filed. Under discussion. Your Honor, document 1768 actually is the replacement for that one. 1767 uh, shouldn't have even come to council, to be very honest. So if I could, Your Honor, could I just move to 1768? Well, can we file 1767 first? All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 1768 all in moment. Thank you. On 1768, I would move then that the report of committee be accepted and that we pass the general ordinance. We have a motion and a second before us. Under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. No. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. And Vanderweel. Aye. 12 ayes, 1 no. Motion carried. 1769 through 1770 will lie over. 1771 to be referred. 1667, submitting a communication from Christine Farber to asking for permission to hold the MS walk in the city of Sheboygan. Who brought that one in? It's just me, so. <laughs> well, we need a motion to accept and file. Alderman. Second. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 
1637 by Alderman Baumann, Warner, and Groff authorizing the purchasing agent to enter into a contract for the purchase of software and equipment to upgrade Sheboygan's transit fare box system. Alderman Bowman. I thank you again, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sigali? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. And Warner? 13 ayes. Motion carried. 1638, a resolution by Alderman Stephan Berg, Manny, and Montemir authorizing a transfer of appropriations in a 2004 budget. Alderman Stephan, you want to take 39 too? If I could, please. Okay. I move the re resolutions 1638, 1639 be put upon their passage. Okay. We have a motion before us in a second. Under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sigali? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. And Warner? Aye. I'm sorry, and Bauman? Aye. <laughs> I did it. You did it. I did it. 13 eyes. Sorry, Dennis. Motion carried. 1620, we have a RC by Special Committee on Risk Management recommending filing documents submitted a claim from State Farm Insurance on behalf of Arn Carney and Carneys for alleged damages to her vehicle when it was struck by a police car in paying the claim in the amount of $1,500. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move that that RC be accepted and adopted. And then also 1621, which was um, uh, a claim from Lori Capellan for alleged damages to her vehicle while when a rock when a rock flew up from a city Sheboygan truck as she was traveling on Highway 23, the committee uh, recommended that that claim be denied and city attorney send notice of, of disallowance. So I would also move that that RC be accepted and adopted. We have a motion before us for 1620 and 1621 <clears throat> that the RCs be accepted and adopted. Under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Bonnet. Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sigali? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Warner? Aye. Bauman? Aye. And Berg? Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 1654, general ordinance by Alderman Warner, Vanderweel, and Serta creating and establishing a municipal court for the city of Sheboygan. Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I move the general ordinance be put upon its passage. Alderman Werner, do you want to take all of them? Or do you want to do one at a time? Oh, I can do them all. Uh, okay. Probably might want to do this one first. Yeah, why don't okay. you do 1654 okay. first? Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor. Uh, first, we do have Rich Gebhardt here and, and, and other members of the staff if any, anyone wants an explanation on this. But first, I would say I truly believe the establishment of a municipal court in the city of Sheboygan mm -hmm. is in the best interests of the city. And that really is the bottom line. The circuit court system is not geared to resolve munici municipal issues and concerns at the level that a local municipal court will. The special committee took a year to study all the facts available. We did not cut any corners. We surveyed cities across the state. We studied state law regarding the establishment of a municipal court. I've got a bag here that, that has the documents in it of everything that we went through the court and read including the surveys of the different municipalities. I mean, we did our work and, and we are very confident that our work is correct and that the recommendation is correct. Providing better service to resolve local code violations in building inspection, traffic cases, and ordinance violations. That's what a municipal court will do. It will be a lower cost to the accused and yes, more revenue, revenue to the city, a better and more effective way to deal with landlords that do not keep the properties up to city standards, thus improving the living conditions of some city residents, the reduction in police overtime costs, and more effective and timely processing of things like parking tickets. The list goes on and on. Sometimes we get uh, snow, snow emergency parking tickets dealt with right now in circuit courts in August. The circuit court system is not a shared service 
to pre and to present it as such is, is actually a stretch of the facts. The circuit courts are greater at addressing crimes and larger issues, but they are not really responsive or good at dealing with the local concerns. And that is not their fault. They just are not designed to do that. Municipal courts are designed to address local code enforcement issues. The special committee talked to our neighbors. Did you know that over 50% of state municipalities have municipal courts? And that number is increasing every year? There's a reason for that. Our neighbors, the village of Kohler, the city of Sheboygan Falls, they have approved the establishment of municipal courts. Our neighbor, the city of Plymouth, has an established municipal court. We have talked to each of these communities and in those talks found their reasons mirror ours for, the, for recommending the establishment of a municipal, a municipal court. As a real shared service, they will share the cost of the court reporting software that will be developed for the municipal court, and that will link the entire city and county crime software system into the court system. A system we now share will actually grow and help everyone. If a municipal court and its obvious benefits are good for over 50% of Wisconsin municipalities, if it's good for the cities of Plymouth and Sheboygan Falls, as well as the village of Kohler, I believe it will be good for the city of Sheboygan as well, and we should move this forward. Under discussion, Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. I've always been uh, a proponent of saving money and perhaps even generating money for our uh, short string budget. Uh, in this case, though, I, I voiced my opinion more than once. Uh, as far as creating a municipal court, while the reasons may sound good, I don't know that the timing is good. We are in a financial uh, mood right now, financial atmosphere that, that anything could happen. And to go off and toy around with new business ventures or try new things out uh, for different reasons, and we could come up with more reasons than, than, uh, than 10. Uh, I don't know that it's very prudent for us to do that uh, fiscally. Um, for us to do the issue of citations and then let it go and let the county use their personnel, their office, computers, equipment, staff, everything, their checks, they mail it to us, we get close to half a million dollars. That to me is shared services. Darn good example of one. And we're proposing to eliminate that uh, and take our chances on a proposal that uh, gives us pretty numbers, but nonetheless, a loss the first year and probably a loss the second year because of the volume uh, of cases that are gonna be generated. Uh, I had a constituent call earlier today and wanted me to ask a question, is what's gonna happen with all those uh, fines that are not gonna be paid? Are we going to become a collection agency too? While we're at it, might as well. The other concern was that uh, what business, what bank in their right mind would finance a business plan under these terms? I don't think there's very many of them. I know I wouldn't, and that's why I'm gonna vote against it. Okay, Alderman Warner. Uh, just a couple of things, Your Honor. Um, in the first case, we, we have included unpaid fines at 25% in our estimated budget. <laughs> So we're taking that into account. We also are recommending that they do not hire the part-time clerk. So all of those numbers that are in there for the part-time clerk in the first year probably will not be considered part of that budget. Rich has run some numbers on this. He's got the information. Uh, he feels confident in it and, and we feel confident in it. All these items have been discussed already. I think it should move forward. And I'd like to actually ask if we could have uh, Larry Hilbling from Building Inspection tell us why this is important to the city of Sheboygan. We could have the police department, Sergeant Katowski, our court officer, tell us why this is important to the city of Sheboygan. I'd like to hear from Paulette and Steve tell us why a municipal court is important to the city of Sheboygan. And I would like to, like to have Rich address the financial aspect of it. Uh, he's, he's done, run some wonderful numbers on this, and I think this is important that we hear all the facts. 
and the reasons why this is important to the city of Sheboygan. Thanks. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I w attended many of the meetings of the uh, committee for the municipal court, and in every aspect that uh, I see as they looked into the situation, they used conservative figures, as uh, Alderman Werner said, on everything they looked at as far as the fines and the uh, unpaid fines and the, even the gen uh, revenue that's generated, the, the figures that you have received were on a conservative side. So I think the committee did an excellent job of studying this. As far as building is, uh, inspection is concerned, I think it's going to make a, a difference in quality of life for our uh, citizens, and that's what we look at uh, for uh, dealing with absentee landlords and uh, citizens who don't necessarily um, clean up their yard and, and obey the orders of the building inspection will have much, uh, time, much more timely prosecution of issues like that and uh, it'll, it'll make our job much easier to uh, uh, enforce the ordinances that, that we try to enforce for the citizens and, and it does make a quality of life issue for, for us. So uh, I'm open to any questions if you have a building inspection and the way we would uh, enforce issues or... Alderman Lange, Mayor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what is it that the county doesn't do for us that this would? I think Alderman Werner addressed it. Uh, many of the issues that we deal with, we issue a uh, citation or an order from uh, uh, our city attorney and the court system, the county court system, tends to look at us as a le in a less priority than some of the criminal cases they deal with. So we are not on a high priority list. We do get postponed in, in different issues where with the municipal court, we could schedule a timely uh, court trial or whatever. And um, the county system doesn't look at us with a priority. And I think that's it's gonna make a world of difference for the police also, because they can have a night court, which would you know, uh, be better for the citizens also so that they could come after work and, and to uh, go to court that way. So it would make it, would make the, um, a bit more quick, the, the justice? The justice would be quicker uh, because we can schedule it quicker. And also the fines would be less. If you, if you read the document, yeah. uh, the fines would definitely less. A, a typical uh, $50 fine right now is $181, I believe. Uh, with the county court cost and with the municipal court, I think it's going to be $102. So if the, if the bond schedule stays the same, uh, the, the fines that the citizens would pay would be actually less. So maybe the, the county takes six months and we'd take three or four months? I don't, I don't know the exact scheduling, but I uh, think it would probably be much less time than that. Okay. Now, I do know the next document says we're going to add some more money on to the, to the charge, so the 102 will go up real quick, but thank you for your... Answers. Alderman Bonet. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, does not a municipal court help us address the issue with some of our problem landlords in the city that we've had and actually being against, against this municipal court actually promotes that type of environment and problems we have in our neighborhoods? We will be able to address that issue quicker and faster. And as we issue citations, uh, absentee landlords, we found since we've begun issuing citations in city in inspection department this spring, we have had more compliance with the ordinances because people get the, the citation in the mail and they uh, do tend to uh, call us back quicker and, and deal with that. But it will help us with uh, landlords definitely because we can uh, get them to court quicker than it has in the past. You know, like uh, many times we do end up with three, four, five, six months down the road when we actually go to court on an issue. Just for clarification for the people at home, uh, what that's trying to say is basically with the problem landlords we have, which I have several of them in my district, which we've gone out and visited, uh, basically people who, I mean, standing against the municipal court basically promotes the fact of having those landlords maintained as, they are, as is in this community. I mean, the problems we have will continue. Oh, the problems will continue, but we'll have quicker resolution of the problems, hopefully, with the municipal court. Thank you for clarifying that. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Larry. Hey, Alderman Manny. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a procedural question. This came from a constituent suggesting that there might be some sort of uh, motivation, a lesser fee if you pay at the court at the end of procedure or within two days as opposed to um, having the fee um, there as an ongoing fee that 
then from that we get our, our unpaid fines building up to 25% built in. So I don't know uh, how that might happen. I'm just asking if we might look into a procedural issue after this kind of thing is in place and perhaps that might be a way to cut that 25% down to 12%. Thank you. Anyone, Alderman Warner, who else did you ask to speak? Oh, uh, thank you, Your Honor. I think uh, Sergeant Katowski, our court services officer. I don't know if I have much more to add than what uh, Alderman Warner had talked about. I, I had input on the committee from the police uh, aspect or, or point of view. I was asked to uh, do research in regards to the overtime issue. Um, I do believe that the overtime can be cut in some respects because we're going to have input and we're going to be able to uh, work with the municipal court as far as scheduling of, of officers. So uh, some of these court cases can be handled while they're on duty instead of off duty and there's, there's overtime pay. Uh, again, like Larry said, also Alderman Warner, it, uh, to look at, at the, the citation, the cost of the citations, we're going to drop the amount of the fine, but yet the city's going to get more money for it. I think that's very important uh, as far as writing the, writing the citations out. I got a letter I was asked to follow up on, or the police department got a letter. Um, Deputy Chief Sherman gave it to me. It was a woman who got cited in the city of Sheboygan on a traffic offense, and it was one of these $181 fines, and she was questioning as to why she lives in Keele and why, if she got arrested in Keele, the cost of that citation or fine would be so much less than we charge in the city of Sheboygan. And that's because the city of Keele has a municipal court and they're able to um, have the fines lower, but uh, for the same violations that, that we have. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Alderman Vanderwell. Thank you, Honor. I just had a question for the, uh, sure. for the officer. Um, if you just comment on your department when they uh, when they ticket in the when there's a when there's a snow emergency, thank you. When there's a snow emergency and you ticket, and then it first goes to court in July or August, how right. many of those are dropped because it's 90 degrees outside and not snowing anymore? I don't know if a lot of them are, are dropped because of that. Um, I, I, I think it's it's much easier to. Um, to prove your point or be able to have, you know, not, not give a citation in the middle of the winter when we just had a storm with 10 inches or 12 inches of snow and this person's trial is going to be held in July or August when it is 90 degrees outside. It's hard to look back and say, well, you know, <laughs> it, uh, there's no snow on the ground now. The municipal court, you'll be talking about probably um, right now when a, when a person's given a, a citation, um, they make an initial appearance in the, in the respect of a parking ticket uh, they can plead not guilty. They come to the desk and plead not guilty. They're given a pretrial notice where they can meet with the assistant city attorney. Uh, and then after that point, it could be anywhere from 60 to 90 days before it gets on the calendar uh, to be heard in the, in the uh, circuit court. Um, and then again, if, if the court's busy or there's an adjournment, it's going to be put off another two months. The municipal uh, ordinances are not a priority. The more the criminal matters are. So that's why it would... Get, get pushed off and um, to be able to get it taken care of as soon as possible I think is much better. Okay. To another discussion, would you call the roll please? All right. oh, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, I, I'd just say I, I prosecuted uh, ordinance and traffic cases in both scenarios. When I was uh, first uh, started practice, I practiced in Longview, Washington. I was assistant corporation counsel there and we had a municipal court uh, and I prosecuted those cases for about three years, and uh, it, it works just fine. Uh, just as it wor works fine here uh, in circuit court, there's pluses and minuses to both of these things. Uh, uh, you know, one plus to municipal court, or many pluses have been discussed already. Uh, one plus to circuit court uh, that you don't have in a in a city the size uh, in municipal court is. Uh, in circuit court, you've got five judges, uh, so there's there's some chance of uh, uh, keeping one judge not straying too far from the mainstream, if you will, or from the consensus of the, the judges. Uh, with municipal court, you've got one judge who's part-timer. Uh, under the ordinance, it would be an attorney, but uh, you hope you get a good one, I guess, uh, because if you don't, you may not be real happy with them. But uh, 
the trend I've seen in Wisconsin uh, in the last, well, since I've been here, uh, the last 17 or 18 years, has been uh, more going towards municipal courts as opposed to going away from them. There, I think uh, a lot of communities in this area in particular have, uh, have started adopting them in the last five or so years. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know exactly why that trend has taken place, uh, but I think it's probably uh, uh, for a lot of the reasons that have been discussed previously. Uh, I think there is a, a feeling that you can, the, the closer you are to the, the court system, uh, the more justice uh, you, can, you can receive. Uh, it's uh, less remove, removed from the general public. Uh, I think the inspectors and the police department have indicated a lot of the positives. Uh, there was one, I should comment, there was one letter to the editor in the paper today about if uh, municipal court's created and if its room is put in uh, the new police station in Sheridan Park uh, that it's going to create all this uh, increased traffic. Uh, they were citing something like uh, they took the 7,200 cases that are referenced in the court budget uh, and divided that by, I think, 24 part-time days and came up with 280-some-odd cases a, a day that uh, would all be driving to the court. Uh, you know, there's a real small percentage actually goes to trial. Uh, a good number pay their citation when they get it. Uh, some request plead not guilty and get a pretrial conference. Uh, a lot of things are settled there. So, you know, uh, you get, I'd say, you know, probably 10% of the cases would actually go to trial, maybe even smaller than that. So uh, you're not going to have an overwhelming number of vehicles, whether you have it uh, in City Hall on a temporary basis or at the police, uh, new police facility. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Steve, you, you stated the case very equitably and fair and clear, and I thank you for that. I have two questions. Um, if this passes, the first judge will be hired, appointed, right? After that, elected? Well, I said that the, the proposal is And then the next question, presently about 10% of the citations that are given out, only 10% go to trial, the rest usually just pay? Pay or get dealt with in some in manner short of having a trial, yes. Some manner. Okay, so that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Alderman Orner. Uh, thank you, Honor. And I don't know if Rich has anything to add. I'd like to give him an opportunity. You received the uh, report from um, the Municipal Court Committee before that they had an opportunity to review, so I won't go through a lot of the detail. A lot of the uh, elements I think have previously been stated, uh, such as we are looking at the um, unpaid uh, court costs of about 25%. Uh, that's based on uh, $23 per, per case. So we're looking about 41000 as being unpaid per year. Uh, what is being uh, what we put together as a, as a proposed budget for 2005 was uh, for the court to start up mid-year, and that's the document that's being referred to the Finance Committee. It would require an advance from the general fund that we're estimating about $50,000 of just the, the cash flow situation you're going through. Um, there would be uh, computer software, furniture, and equipment that have to be ordered here uh, early in, in 2005 to be able to, to set up the facility. and. Uh, so you would have you know, supplies and those things that would have to be uh, in place before the course started. And, uh, and there would be uh, some cash flow lag because of once the court is in session, if the judge gives the people 60 days to pay, whatever, it would be some time until that, till that's uh, received. But then um, by year end, um, the court, uh, we're going to set up a separate municipal court fund and uh, then that fund should be able to pay back the advance and then contribute the net amount uh, between the expenses and revenues. Right now we're looking at uh, total expenditures in the, that half year 
uh, $76,823. And uh, the net amount that would be uh, repaid or contributed back to the general fund of 215000 but that also means, that, of course, that the revenue stream from the county is changing during that time. Uh, right now we have in the budget uh, a revenue estimate of 450000 uh, from the court fines from the county. So obviously as this increases, the, the flow from the county will be decreasing. So it will be uh, uh, equally now basically during that time. It's hard to say exactly how, how that will flow. But. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. I don't want to go into too much detail. I know you've heard a, a lot presented here this evening on this. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I promise this is the last question. When this judge, the one, the one, as you said, the one, could campaign as a tough judge or he could campaign as a lenient judge. If he campaigned as a lenient judge, we're down the... So we're, right? Well, the issue isn't how they campaign, it's how they rule from the bench, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it would be an elected position, two-year terms. That's what's uh, being proposed. And uh, it'd be like uh, any other judge that runs for election. Right. OK, thank you. Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. So basically what I've heard tonight and what I've seen in the report is that the operation of the municipal court will not only operate at the same amount, bringing in the same amount of revenue, if not more, um, it's going to help our departments run more um, effectively. Um, things will be done in a more timely manner. And also, it's a win-win for the individuals who are cited because the costs will be lowered, correct? Correct. OK, thank you. All right, with that, Alderman Warner, do you have anything else? I don't want to find out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, Sue, would you call the roll, please? Okay. Um, Serta. Aye. Graf. No. Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. No. Perez. No. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. And Pone. <laughs> Three three nine, nine. Ten eyes, three nose. Motion carried. Okay, 1655, General Ordinance by Alderman Warner, Vanderweel, and Serta, relating to the recoupment of the costs involved in enforcing and processing commitment and warrants. Alderman Warner. Uh, Your Honor, should I take, let's see, we have. Through 59. 1655 through 59, actually. Yep. If no one has any objections, go right ahead. On that, Your Honor, I'd move that uh, the ordinances be put upon their passage. We have a motion and a second before us. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, uh, document number 1655 is an ordinance relating to recoupment of costs involved in enforcing and processing commitments and warrants. Uh, Alderman Montemayor re uh, referred to this one earlier. But this, what this ordinance actually does, Your Honor, is it allows the police department to charge people who have to have a blood test done instead of the taxpayers paying for it. They will pay for that cost of that blood test. Right now, the taxpayers are paying for the cost of that blood test. Does the county charge now, or do, do when they no. do it? I believe yeah. that the county is charging. No. They may or may not be. Okay. But they do charge warrant pickup yeah. fees and things of that nature. But this ordinance will allow the city to recoup some of the costs in dealing with, with these lawbreakers. Right now, uh, city taxpayers are paying for the blood tests, and with this, the cost will be borne by the offender. That's all it really amounts to on that one. It also allows a charge of $25 for a warrant pickup fee, which is issued uh, by either city officer or county officer when a, when a city police officer has to pick up someone on a warrant will be able to charge a fee for that. Right now, we're doing it for nothing, and, and if the criminals are in the city, the county's getting these people picked up for free. So that's now, just hold that thought a minute. Alderman Montemayor, you have a question on this? Yes, I, I can see where, where you mentioned the thing about the blood test and the warrant pickup fee, but there's also another one mm -hmm. simply mm -hmm. for a processing fee of $25. Correct. That's for the... Chief, if you want to explain.
these ideas uh, came from other departments and or from officers within our own department. As far as the, uh, the blood test, if you have a drunk driver or OAWI, instead of the intoxilizer, we would take a blood test. We've been being charged that and we've been paying that for years. As far as the warrant uh, pickup fee, uh, that would be a $25 fee associated with picking someone up and taking them to the county jail, which the county does. The next fee, which is a handling fee, so to speak. When we bring someone in and take a warrant, we, we take in the, the warrant money, we must then uh, sit down, our deputy chief must sit down, count the money and or write out a check to the appropriate agency. So a part of the deputy chief's time every day is handling bond money, things of that nature that we write off to another department. So we would ask that there's a fee associated with that for to, pit, to recoup some of our, our time. Just a second little question. If this person, say the blood test or the commitment or the warrant pickup, turns out to be not guilty, they still have given up that money, right? And it's gone? Well, sure. If, if uh, everyone has a right to the trial, right. uh, for example, on a uh, drunk driving case, we still have the blood test done. So the fee is still there. The, the test okay. has been uh, taken, or the blood has been taken for the test. Um, as far as the warrant, the warrants is normally uh, for someone who is not gone right. to court or failed to appear and things of that nature. It was the processing fee that I was particularly asking about. Yeah, the processing fee is that time that my deputy chief spends taking in money and or going up to the uh, to, uh, finance department for them to take uh, credit cards or things of this nature. And these would be by the municipal judge, the municipal judge, so it isn't, could we enact these and still continue with the circuit court? I'm not sure what you're asking, Steve. I'm not sure. Either. Why would you? I mean, if we enact our own court, not, why would you? Not the fees, no. These fees have to do with a municipal court. Right. And I should clarify that in item sub one, the cost of prosecution, the, uh, the blood draws are deemed to be cost of prosecution and those are only uh, added on to the cost if a defendant's convicted. In the municipal court? Yeah, mm -hmm. but the, the blood draws, you don't just charge somebody for taking a blood draw, it would be added on as costs in the event the individual is convicted uh, and you'd charge then for the blood draw but not if they were found not guilty. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Again, Your Honor, on that too, the, the, the blood draw fee right now is being paid by the taxpayers. We're paying it anyway when we have to draw blood. It's coming out of the city budget. It's coming out of property taxpayers' pockets to pay for the blood draw. So what we're doing is we're making the person that had to have the blood draw pay for it. That's all. It's that simple. Instead of the people that live next door to you, behind you, and around you. So. And on the next document, 1656, this is an ordinance related, relating to the sale of unclaimed articles, including bicycles. In sub 1A, the police department, it says the police department may dispose of any personal property that has been abandoned or remained unclaimed for a period of 30 days after the taking of possession of the property by an officer via a public auction, a sale bid by contract, a trade or other property to be property property to be acquired by the city or retention for use by the city. In sub B, what this is doing is it's allowing us to stop maintaining all this property for a whole year. We're holding these bicycles up. We just had the bike auction last fall. Uh, this is going to allow us to sell those bicycles and other property quicker. We have to hold on to it for a said period of time, give people a, a chance to claim their property, and we don't have to spend all those man hours maintaining these items at taxpayer expense. We can sell them, get a little bit of income, and move forward with it. It's going to help the police department a great deal. We're, we've been reluctant over the years to increase the size of our force, but we're still trying to do all these things, and this is going to help. Right now we have Sergeant Tarkowski and some of the other officers getting paid overtime to deal with some of these things. It's difficult to store this. You have to have space. We're running out of storage space, and this is going to help on that aspect of it. On 1657, this is an ordinance uh, relating to a 30-minute parking limit so as to add to south side of Superior Avenue 
located at 1119 Superior Avenue. Uh, this is the area uh, by the Diamond Vogel paint store across from the funeral home. And what happens is people, patrons of the funeral home at many times park in front of his store and his customers can't get in. He's got a little indented area there in front of the store where you can get two vehicles in. Customers can come in. This is just going to add that to the 30 minute limit so that they have enough time to go in there, buy their paint and leave. Obviously, he's not going to complain if they're there 31 minutes and they're his customers, but if they're there for an hour and they're not his customers, he would like to have some room for his customers to park, and it's a problem in that area. On document 1658, this is relating to turn restrictions at Grant School, uh, 1528 North 5th Street, to add no left turn into or out of the school driveway. Uh, this is a safety issue brought forward by the Grant School principal and the traffic and, and Sergeant Tarkowski of our traffic department. And in the interest of safety of the school children, the Public Protection Safety Committee recommends this change at Grant School. And document 1659 is an ordinance relating to the one hour parking limit. So as add, to add the north side of Seaman Avenue located at 1520 Seaman Avenue um, to the one hour parking limits. And this is, uh, will allow a one hour parking limit in front of Locate Staffing's building only, directly in front of their building and nowhere else. There's not any homes right there in that area. You have uh, the dry cleaners and such on the corner, churches across the street. Uh, and the committee recommends approval of that also. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I just thought it was interesting and creative um, with that just one more issue on um, 1655 with the warrant fee. Those are initiated, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, by other mun municipalities to issue those warrants using our manpower, and that fee is actually, isn't it, charged back to the municipalities? So I thought that was a wonderful way. So we're actually, they're using our manpower to pick up individuals for their warrants, and here is a way to, to charge them back, so. To another discussion, will you call the roll, please? Vanderweel. Warner. Aye. Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Laufs? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sigali? Aye. And Stefan? Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 1772 can be accepted and placed on file. 1773 will go to City Plan Commission. Steve, other matters? Um, not really, just 1774 is an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from the Stephanie H. Wild Center for the Performing Arts regarding their Walk of Fame project proposal to create and install stone plates to replace existing concrete sidewalk panels in front of the center. 1775. That's a communication from Fred File regarding issues he is having with his cable TV service through charter communications. Risk. 1776, a communication from Cindy Hare questioning Alderperson Perez's statement about not understanding the city budget. Finance. Moved and second to adjourn under discussion. Yes. I'm sorry, Alderman Graff. 1775, you said to risk? Risk. Shouldn't that go to finance? Yes, it should. Oh, I'm sorry. Should. Finance, too. And 1774, where does that go? That's public going works. to public works. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, we have a motion to second before us. So under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye.